When the working class and peasantry took power in Russia in October 1917, there were three main architectural tendencies which all competed with each other. Realistic classicism, rationalism and constructivism. Later a fourth group, so-called proletarian architects, organized themselves into VOPRA, or the All-Union Society of Proletarian Architects. Classicism drew inspiration especially from ancient Greco-Roman models, the Renaissance and Russian national architecture. Its leading figures were Zoltovsky and Skutsev. This tendency will be further discussed in a later episode. There was also a style of sorts in the late Russian Empire known as eclecticism, which was a vulgarized type of architecture using pseudo-classical sources. Enemies of classicism often lumped them both together into the eclectic category. Constructivism was a tendency that arose mainly in the 1910s, and it will be discussed in more detail in the next episode. The main idea of constructivism is that the form of the building emerges from its function, or represents its function. Constructivist buildings are often characterized by a highly geometric and industrial look, and they are often designed to look like machines. Constructivism was often also called utilitarianism by its opponents, because constructivism tries to be oriented towards practice, and at least theoretically puts the form of the building to a very subordinate position compared to its function, seemingly ignoring all aesthetic qualities. The constructivists were mainly united into the OSA, or Organization of Modern Architects. The third tendency, rationalism, is the topic of this video. The rationalists were a modernist tendency whose buildings are characterized by abstract geometric shapes. They were also called formalists by their critics because they emphasized form and aesthetic quality more than functionality. Their view of aesthetic quality, however, was not really based on beauty, but rather on an idea of rationality, hence the name rationalism. They considered that in architecture, forms that are easy to perceive, or, quote, requiring the least mental energy, unquote, were rational. What exactly does that mean in practice? Well, we'll get into that. The rationalists were heavily inspired by the artistic tendency called suprematism, developed by Malevich and Elisitsky. The rationalists were also influenced by idealist gestalt psychology, imperial criticism, and the aesthetic philosophy of Kant. Rationalists were organized into ASNOVA, or the Association of New Architects. ASNOVA was created in the mid-1920s. Later, a split occurred where some of them constituted a new organization called ARU, or Association of Architect Urbanists. Alongside the architectural debate between formalists, constructivists, classicists and the VOPRA, there was also a debate concerning city planning. Many architects, mainly constructivists, but also some others, supported so-called anti-urbanism, while many formalists supported urbanism. That debate will also be discussed in a later episode. The rationalists and constructivists were both extremely hostile to each other, however, they had much in common, and the buildings they designed look very similar, despite the different methods used. Eventually, both of them were defeated by socialist realist architecture. In the course of several videos, I will first provide a criticism of the erroneous anti-communist views of these tendencies, and then I will explain the Marxist-Leninist socialist realist view of architecture. The rationalists and constructivists are always portrayed very favorably by capitalist writers, who try to make them look good and use them to fight against socialist realism and Marxism-Leninism. Capitalist writers try to portray these modernist artists as superior artistically and even more in accordance with Marxism and the revolution. It is very characteristic that capitalist writers rarely focus on socialist realism, but the vast majority of literature on this topic focuses only on these modernist trends, such as rationalism and constructivism. But we must look at these trends critically in the light of facts. According to Marxist theory, the economy of a given society forms a base, on top of which arises an ideological superstructure. This ideological superstructure includes many forms of perceiving the world, philosophy, science, politics, religion, as well as art. Art, according to Marxism, is part of the superstructure and is a specific form of social consciousness, or a specific way of understanding the world. Art is political and ideological. Even if the artist in question claims to not be involved in politics, they are still expressing some aspect of the ideological climate of the given society. There is no so-called neutral art, which is not ideological or political, and not expressing the interest of a given class.
In fact, the opposite is the case. Art can be either more or less consciously political, or spontaneously political. Spontaneously political art is more often anti-communist, because in capitalist society the reactionary ideological hegemony of the decaying capitalist class prevails, and it continues to have a strong influence for a long time, even after capitalism is overthrown. Furthermore, the traditions of thousands of years of class struggle will continue to influence people for a long time. Marxism denounces the capitalist theory of art for art's sake, which states that art shouldn't have any message or politics. Art for art's sake is actually only a cover to hide the bourgeois nature of such supposedly neutral art. The rationalist-slash-formalist organization Asnova actually claimed to support socialism, but they still described their formalist principles by the phrase, quote, the measure of architecture is architecture, unquote. That is, the equivalent of art for art's sake in architecture. This was also pointed out by a Soviet critic, who writes, quote, The main slogan, under the sign of which Asnova came out, was the slogan, Measure architecture with architecture. Comparing the speeches of formalists in other areas of art, we find an analogy to this slogan, Literature for literature, art for art's sake. The thesis that art can be understood and explained only from its own foundations. The assertion of the complete autonomy of art from public life." Unquote. Asnova also had many commonalities with the ultra-left theories of the so-called prolet cult or proletarian culture movement. Prolet cult was an organization and movement started by the revisionist Bogdanov, whose theories Lenin had destroyed in his classic philosophical work, Materialism and Imperial Criticism. Bogdanov advocated the idealist philosophy of imperial criticism, which denied dialectical materialism and claimed that the objective world does not exist or is not cognizable. Bogdanov called this proletarian philosophy. Bogdanov's idea of proletarian culture, or prolet cult, was that the workers must reject practically all traditions, that the proletariat must create an absolutely new culture with nothing in common with past history. This basically anarchistic idea is deeply anti-Marxist. Marxism considers that the workers must absorb and master all past human culture and critically evaluate it, taking its best elements and developing them further. The future culture can only be built on top of the past. Socialism will be built by taking the industry and science developed in capitalism and not by destroying industry and science. The erroneous aspects of past science and industry will be left behind, and the usable aspects will be critically reworked and developed further. Lenin wrote, quote, The task of Marxists is to be able to master and refashion the achievements of these bourgeois scientists, and to be able to lop off their reactionary tendency to pursue our own line and to combat the whole line of the forces and classes hostile to us, unquote. And, quote, Only a precise knowledge and transformation of the culture created by the entire development of mankind will enable us to create a proletarian culture." Unquote. Marx himself considered ancient Greek art still to be, quote, in certain respects regarded as a standard and unattainable ideal, unquote, for contemporary art. So-called avant-garde abstract art movements follow an anarchistic method. They think that they can create something supposedly entirely new, totally rejecting everything from the past. But in reality, such art movements have always merely copied reactionary imperialist fads and have never created anything original at all. The same goes for Asnova. Asnova followed Bogdanov's idea that all past culture must be rejected, both good and bad. Capitalist historian Hudson writes the following, quote, Asnova's concept of architecture remained deeply rooted in Kasimir Malevich's suprematism. This concept, in turn, was based on a rather vulgar interpretation of Marxism. According to the suprematists, each mode of production generated not only a ruling class, but also an official artistic style supported by that dominant social class. Deviations from that official style were the products of subordinate classes. All art, prior to the rule of the proletariat, therefore, manifested the ideology of some class. But the revolution was to bring about the destruction, not merely of the bourgeoisie, but of all classes as such. Consequently, the art of the proletarian revolution must be the expression not merely of another style, but of absolute, eternal, so-called supreme values. As Hudson says, Asnova relied on the idealist views of Malevich, 
Malevich believed that there are certain so-called absolute, eternal, supreme values, which are both class-neutral and ahistorical. In his paintings, in works such as Black Square, Malevich tried to express these supreme ideas by maximum abstraction, with only two-dimensional geometric shapes with flat colors. According to Ikonikov, quote, As Nova members describe themselves as rationalists, seeing the chief task in organizing and rationalizing the perception of architecture, unquote. But for them, this rationalizing meant something quite specific, which again was drawn from suprematism. Ikonikov continues, quote, As Nova was under an especially strong influence of Malevich's suprematism, his advocation of austerity as the measure of art's value provided the basis for the principle of so-called psychological energy, seen by rationalist leader Ladovsky as the chief criterion of form shaping in architecture. He attempted to base Asnova's rationalistic aesthetics on data of experimental psychology or so-called psychotechnics." Unquote. The leading figure of Asnova, Ladovsky, wrote that, quote, "...modern aesthetics is about saving the psychophysical energy of man." Unquote. As a Marxist critic pointed out, quote, "...it is necessary to establish how they understand rationality itself." Architectural rationality, writes one of the leaders of formalism, N. Ladovsky, is based on an economic principle in the same way as technical rationality. The difference lies in the fact that technical rationality is the saving of labor and material when creating an expedient structure, and architectural rationality is the saving of mental energy when perceiving the spatial and functional properties of the structure. The synthesis of these two rationalities in one structure is rational architecture. Unquote. And then the Marxist writer further says that, Already here, the moments of an idealistic understanding of architecture are striking. Architecture is reduced to pure technology and pure form, and form is made dependent on perception. The basic thing that we consider to be decisive for architecture, its dependence on certain forms of social relations, on socio-economic conditions, is thrown out. Unquote. He further writes, quote, we can find the development of these provisions in a number of formalists. Their philosophical essence goes back to the aesthetics and philosophy of Kant, who puts forward form as the basis of art and aesthetic judgment, excluding the latter from the socio-practical environment. However, they go back to Kant's aesthetics for the most part not directly, but through the latest idealistic movements. The connection with modern idealist philosophy is easily revealed if we compare the main provisions of Machian philosophy, that is, imperial criticism, with the provisions of the formalists. The principle of saving psychic energy corresponds to Mach's principle of least waste of effort." Unquote. The Marxist critic correctly points out the idealist character of Asnova's theories. They correctly point out that the suprematist principle of economizing mental energy is the same as that of the Marxists, that is, imperial critics. He calls the aesthetic views of Asnova Kantian, because according to the classical idealist Kant, forms of consciousness and forms of perception are eternal, non-class, and ahistorical. According to Kant's idealist views, aesthetics are not determined by societal factors, but are eternal and are determined by the very structure of our consciousness. This is the exact view of the Asnova rationalists. In fact, that is the core of their theory. The Marxist writer Mihailov writes in a different article, quote, Formalists reduce architectural form to perception. For them, this architectural form exists only in perception and is subordinate to it. Again, there is no special need to prove that here the formalists are simply applying the old idealistic position that being, reality, is determined by consciousness. The materialist will seek an explanation for the evolution of architecture in specific historical, social conditions, while the formalist will look for the eternal laws of perception, which, in his opinion, determine the change of architectural forms. The eternal laws of perception, rooted in the unchanging nature of man, man, quote-unquote, generally, devoid of any social connections, plus the artistic will of the architect, based on the knowledge of these laws, are the so-called factors that determine the work of the architect for the formalists. How should so-called artistic will be expressed, and what is it based on? The rationalists readily answer this question. An architect-artist, writes rationalist Dokuchev, quote, 
in addition to knowledge of the construction and technical side of construction, must at the same time be an artist who has undergone a rational school of studying the needs of the human eye, and who knows how to methodically satisfy these needs. The foundations of our perception rest on laws and principles that are deeply objective in nature. The psychophysiological foundations of our perception do not change so quickly and do not depend on fashion. Therefore, the architect artist must raise, and not follow fashion, the consumer to understand these objective laws of the art of architecture, which take into account our ability to perceive forms and space. The technique that architecture uses must itself be subordinate in its design to the principles of architecture." Unquote. What do all these provisions essentially mean? Essentially, they set out a program of idealistic, bourgeois aesthetics and try to impose it on the proletariat under the guise of so-called eternal laws of perception, and hence the so-called eternal laws of harmony, rhythm, etc. The anti-Marxist, anti-proletarian character of such a program is completely obvious." Unquote. Another Marxist writer, Tsapenko, writes the following, quote, The entire history of idealism in art was full of endless tricks to create some so-called eternal laws of art that ignored its social conditioning. For example, one of the founders of psychological aesthetics, Fechner, in the second half of the 20th century, wrote about the six main laws of perception of peace and beauty. According to Fechner, these laws are as follows. Intensity, aesthetic threshold, intensification of impressions, unity, lack of contradictions, clarity and associations. Close to them, are the so-called five pairs of concepts by Wolflin, one of the founders of modern formalist art criticism. These are linear flatness and picturesqueness, flatness and depth, closeness and openness, plurality and unity, absolute and relative clarity. Theorists from Asnova found themselves captive of these anti-scientific, metaphysical ideas about art. Extreme formalists from Asnova placed special emphasis on geometric expressiveness of form as a manifestation of absolute static and dynamic properties. As we have already seen, in a number of cases, geometrical properties were given a naive symbolic social interpretation, such as that the spiral expresses the idea of revolution, etc. But soon, even such a primitive public understanding of architecture seemed to formalists as something too social. Their further experiments in the field of psychological perception of architecture came down to the fact that architecture must express abstract ideas from the world of physics and geometry, ideas of gravity, elasticity, rhythm, repetition, etc. Unquote. Chapenko points out that as Nova rationalists originally gave crude symbolistic meanings to various geometric shapes, such as a spiral means revolution, or, like in Elisitsky's poster, Beat the Whites with the Red Wedge, the capitalist whites are represented by stationary spheres and squares, while the communist reds are represented by dynamic and moving triangles. But later, even this crude social symbolism became too concrete for the rationalists, and they retreated even further away from real life, even further into abstraction, trying to express in their works only such quote-unquote eternal and supreme values as gravity, movement, contrast, etc. The Marxist critic also pointed out how utterly Asnova was detached from the reality of socialist construction, and how they worshipped abstract form isolated from social content. For instance, quote, At one time, the magazine of Asnova, Izvestia Asnova, published a very interesting project by Elisitsky in this regard, a series of skyscrapers for Moscow. The skyscraper, in the shape of the letter H, is given in this project horizontally raised above the ground on stilts. How does the author explain this unusual form of residential structure? Elisitsky writes that, until the possibilities of completely free soaring have been invented, we tend to move horizontally, not vertically. Therefore, if there is no space on the ground for horizontal planning in a given area, we raise the required usable area onto stilts. And Elisitsky further explains, I proceed from the balance of two contrasts. A. The city consists of atrophying old parts and growing living new ones. We wanted to deepen this contrast. And B. To give the structure itself spatial balance as a result of contrasting vertical and horizontal stresses. Unquote. To which the critic responds, Thus, the form was based on two points. A. 
This form of technology for orientation, human movement in space, which fully corresponds to the above-sided position of the formalists, that architecture serves the so-called highest technical need of man to navigate in space, and b the formal aesthetic task of achieving a contrast of horizontal and vertical tensions which corresponds to the fetishism of abstract form. But the result was a structure that stands in stark contrast to the possibilities for urban reconstruction that exist in the USSR, a refusal to develop new types of housing that correspond to new social relations. Elisitsky did not try to pose all these questions. All this turned out to be unimportant for him." Unquote. This slogan, that the highest need of man is to navigate in space, is a famous rationalist slogan. So in other words, Elisitsky designed what he calls his horizontal skyscraper, which is a building that is impossible to build and completely useless. He designed it because he wanted to make a point to emphasize the so-called contrast between the atrophying old part of the city and the living and growing new part of the city. Presumably this new part is represented by the skyscraper. And he also thought that the design looks cool because it combines vertical and horizontal stresses. But needless to say, such design principles are completely detached from the needs of concrete life. Such views of Asnova became increasingly more of a problem as socialist construction advanced because they fell behind from the current architectural tasks and the importance of practical tasks was emphasized more and more, especially after the criticism of the De Boring School in philosophy. I will put a link in the description for my video discussing the criticism of the De Boring School, which was criticized, among other things, for being out of touch with reality and out of touch with practice. And a writer from Vopra, Mihailov, wrote at the time, quote, we especially emphasize the groundless fantasy and utopianism of formalist architecture in the field of solving social and everyday problems of today and the idealistic nature of their theories and methods of work." Unquote. Certainly a justified criticism. At the first Congress of Soviet Architects in 1937, K. S. Alabian criticized, quote, "...the early years of Soviet architecture, years of so-called paper architecture, divorced from the demands of the people and cut off from real construction." The ultimate product of these years was merely formalistic sleight of hand. A labian turned to Asnova, which flowed from the aforementioned cult of abstract form." Unquote. Certainly, Elisitsky's horizontal skyscraper is a perfect example of such purely paper architecture. It should be noted that such paper architecture did not arise by chance, but due to a combination of factors. One, as a result of the influence of Western bourgeois art. Two, as a result of idealist petty bourgeois views detached from reality, and to a significant degree, three, as a result of the economic situation of the country at the time. During the Civil War and early NEP years, only very little actual construction took place because of the country's poverty. Architects from a bourgeois background and with bourgeois ideas had time to create utopian designs on paper, but no resources to actually build. Of course, even during this period, many reasonable designs were created and some were later utilized. Certainly, the economic situation, which prevented real construction, caused the modernist architects to become more and more experimental and detached from reality in their designs, because they didn't have to worry about actually trying to make their designs a reality. When socialist construction was put on the order of the day, and even when simple economic reconstruction was demanded, those kinds of architectural ideas were hopelessly inadequate. The Asnova notion that architecture doesn't deal with specific social goals, with materials, etc., but with abstract space, and that, quote, man's highest need is navigation through space, unquote, also came under attack by Marxists. It was revealed to be completely idealist and out of touch with reality. Again, according to a Vopra writer, Quote, Vopra believes that architecture should meet specific social needs and express specific content. Content can be something ideological, but it can also be considered as utility. As Nova leaders state that architecture should serve the highest technical need of man to navigate in space. In other words, a highly abstract type of function. You know, if you think about it, what is the purpose of this building? And they say, it's to facilitate movement in general. The Vopra writer continues, Vopra comes from the demands of the proletariat as a class subject of proletarian architecture, as Nova comes from the so-called objective laws of vision, from so-called spatial logic and so-called economy of mental energy. Vopra 
for conveying through architecture the deepest intentions, aspirations and ideas of the working class, as Nova for the so-called eternal objective beauty of forms that speak of, quote, power and weakness, greatness and baseness, finitude and infinity, unquote. Typical fetishes of preaching idealistic aesthetics. In fact, they preach and adapt idealistic bourgeois theories. Kant's doctrine that aesthetic pleasure does not stand in connection with practice, Wolfin's so-called categories of vision, the reduction of the evolution of art to the so-called objective laws of vision, Fiedler's autonomy of art, Hildebrand's provisions on the certainty of our relationship to the outside world by the knowledge and representation of space and form, and the understanding of art as pure visual form. All this found its place in the theory and method of the so-called rationalists. During the debate between the dialectician school of Deborin and the Mechanists, as Nova allied itself with the Deborinists and attacked its rivals, the Constructivists, as Mechanists. While it was not incorrect to accuse the Constructivists of Mechanism, the Formalists themselves were not by any means free from serious mistakes. As Nova waged an ultra-leftist campaign against their Constructivist rivals, interpreting Deborin's dialectics in a voluntarist way, claiming that all tradition must be destroyed and using class conflict terminology, while the constructivists, on the other hand, utilized Buharin's theories of equilibrium and class harmony. Hudson writes that, quote, rejecting OSAs, that is the constructivists, stress on inter-class cooperation in solving concrete problems of building a socialist environment, as Nova parodied the Stalinist clichés regarding the class ideological functions of architecture and the need for architecture to symbolize an idea." Unquote. Now, it is completely dishonest for Hudson to call as Nova's views so-called Stalinist clichés on class ideological functions of architecture, because as Nova advocated theories of non-class or class-neutral, that is, in reality, bourgeois aesthetics, and because the only sense in which Asnova understood class conflict was metaphysical and Bogdanovist, they believed that class conflict means the destroying of all tradition. They considered that each new ruling class simply destroys the past, instead of critically assimilating, reworking and developing it. That is not to say that there was nothing positive to the rationalists. As stated by a Marxist writer, Ladovsky split from Asnova and created a new organization, the ARU, in 1928. The ARU attempted to be more praxis-oriented, though it ultimately failed in this regard. An anti-communist historian writes the following, quote, In 1928, Ladovsky and a few other members left ASNOVA, which they considered too involved in abstract theory. They formed the Association of Urban Architects, ARU, in order to concentrate on planning methods essential to the reconstruction of the state and particularly the development of nationalized land. They considered architecture as a socialist and psychological means of educating the masses. They advocated courses in urbanism and the popularization of their aims. Projects were carried out by Ladovsky and students of Fekutemas, a theater in Sverdlovsk, a housing estate for the Telbesk factory, Trubnoy Square in Moscow, and plans for the development of Middle Asia." Unquote. Quote, by the beginning of the period of socialist reconstruction, the formalists began to come closer to practice, and the Association of Urban Architects, ARU, separated from them in 1928. Positive changes were manifested in the fact that the formalists who joined the ARU set themselves specific tasks of participating in the planning and redevelopment of cities. They tried to set these tasks in accordance with the requirements of socialist construction, listing the main features of a city in a socialist system, in contrast to the West, they point to a number of socio-economic and political aspects that must be taken into account as the basis for planning work. However, despite individual shifts, the formalists, renaming themselves urban architects, remained in their old position on the main decisive issues." Unquote. Also, rationalism, while upholding a rather warped view of aesthetics, still did not deny aesthetics to the same degree as constructivism, which I will discuss next time. Bazdirev writes in a very good article that, quote, Rationalism, led by N.A. Ladovsky, while sharing many of the constructivist principles, was more favorable to classical heritage and allowed for some decorativity, unquote. Though Asnova's views were completely confused and totally non-class and ahistorical, some of their ideas were not wrong. But these are usually only details of lesser importance, such as their ideas like the unity of buildings and their environment, the unity of architectural ensembles, that is, uh, 
groups of buildings, parks and things like that, instead of focusing solely on individual buildings, etc., were correct and had dialectical features. The rivals, the constructivists, believed that the function of the building ought to completely determine its form, and design should be done, so to say, from inside out, one building at a time, disregarding whether the building fits its environment. And while constructivism completely rejects aesthetic values, Asnova obviously doesn't do that, and they even allow for some decorations on buildings, but it's just that their view of aesthetic values is based on this weird concept of rationality, the economy of mental energy or psychophysiological energy in perception, etc., etc. To summarize, Asnova's views were eventually rejected by Marxists and the architectural community, both for theoretical and practical problems. Asnova tried to develop a so-called rational aesthetics, which reduced aesthetic value to the crude idea that a building which requires the least mental energy to perceive is rational. This was based on idealist theories derived from suprematism and reactionary philosophy. It was analogous to empirio criticist views. Asnova spent a lot of effort studying perception through laboratory methods, but aesthetic beauty cannot be measured like that. Asnova's view of aesthetics was incredibly flawed because it believed that since aesthetics was purely rooted in laws of perception, it should therefore remain the same for all classes and all times. It was thus a normative type of aesthetics, but like so often happens, it didn't correspond to reality at all, and no society has ever followed the guidelines of Asnova. This theory is anti-Marxist since it is class-neutral and ahistorical. A materialist understanding must recognize that aesthetics develops historically based on material causes and reflects class interests, though it shouldn't be understood simplistically. Asnova actually held the suprematist view that each class has its own style of art, which is an oversimplification, but Asnova considered that this is irrational and therefore focused on creating the art of the classless society, which would have no class character. This further put them out of touch with reality because classes still existed. That view was derived from the suprematist notion that art must not reflect material reality, but so-called supreme values beyond the material world, or outside the material world. Marxists could not accept such idealism. These ideas eventually became reduced to crude symbolism, where abstract shapes are given some ideological meaning. Now, as Nova was correct to consider that buildings have an ideological effect on the viewer, but they understood this in such a crude form that it became useless because nobody is going to see a triangular building and be convinced that communism is correct. It's not that simple. This topic will be further discussed in a later episode. Furthermore, Asnova even retreated from this to expressing even more abstract supreme values such as abstract gravitation, motion, contradiction, etc., which is truly just formalism, that is, the worship and fetishization of experiments with forms for their own sake. All these criticisms showed that rationalism was totally unacceptable and unworkable, despite their attempts to justify it by appealing to Marxism, and it should be borne in mind that I have not even contrasted Asnova to socialist realism yet. When I start to discuss socialist realism, it will become even more apparent how Asnova meets none of the criteria that was required. However, the failure of Asnova is blatant even without discussing realism at all. Despite all these philosophical and theoretical criticisms, however, the most important flaw with rationalism was that it was simply not feasible or practical. Practice was always the most important criteria for the Soviet Union. Constructivism was also criticized theoretically, but always received at least some praise for its practical achievements. Asnova, on the other hand, had much fewer such achievements. Their ideas were often impossible to implement and were a hindrance. As such, they had absolutely zero chance of winning the architectural debate. As Ikonikov writes, Asnova, quote, remained until its demise a relatively small grouping based mainly in Moscow, unquote. The group ran into a deep crisis from which it couldn't recover, and its leading architects eventually adopted more workable ideas. Ladovsky and Elisitsky, for example, both adopted socialist realism later and contributed to socialist construction. 